Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Avery McRae and here are today's top stories. The boots of Canadian Armed Forces have hit the ground in Bearskin Lake First Nation, which declared a state of emergency due to an outbreak of COVID-19. A release from the Ministry of Defence says 10 Canadian Rangers have been activated, some of whom were already in the community in isolation. Last week, there were outcries as to what was taking the military so long. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu says there is a protocol around bringing in the armed forces, which requires an official request rather than a press release or public statement. It can create confusion and it's not necessarily the best way to plan uh, from, a, from the military's perspective on how to use uh, limited resources in a time where all of the country is under surge. I do notes there were federal resources on the ground prior to the deployment of the Rangers assisting the community. The Canadian Rangers will be providing similar support such as preparing firewood and delivering supplies to homes. Haidu adds it's been heartwarming to see support from other communities in the region through snowmobile caravans and community members returning home to volunteer. One of the positives she says that has come out of the Bearskin Lake outbreak is that nobody has required hospitalization or a medevac, which she attributes to being fully vaccinated. The community had a high rate of vaccination, meaning that even though people got sick, they weren't severely sick requiring hospitalization or, and or ICU uh, admission. According to Haidu, this outbreak has also served as a reminder as to how debilitating COVID and its variants can be from both the health and a functioning society aspect. She stresses communication is key in situations like this and says her ministry will continue to be there for Bearskin Lake. There's been another big jump in COVID cases in the region and the number of infected patients at the Thunder Bay Regional Hospital continues to creep upwards. There are now 19 patients in the dedicated COVID unit. That's four more than on Friday. And the number of COVID patients in the ICU remains at two. Hospital occupancy is now at 99.2% and the ICU occupancy is down to 77.3%. The district health unit is reporting 207, or 268 new cases since Friday. More than 200 of them are in the Thunder Bay area and the other 60 are along the North Shore or in First Nations communities. There are 308 active cases and 52 of those are at the district jail. OPSU officials say 22 inmates and 30 staff members are now infected, but so far the jail has not required any correctional officers to be brought in from other locations. Meanwhile, the Northwestern Health Unit had 153 new cases since Friday, and the number of hospitalizations is up one to seven. 55 of the new cases are in the Kenora area, while Sioux Lookout has 35, Dryden with 22, and Fort Francis has 33. The number of people with COVID-19 in Ontario hospitals continues to rise. There are at least 2,467 2, patients hospitalized with the virus, including 438 in the ICU. Of those, 230 feet, th 234 sorry, are breathing with the assistance of a ventilator. Meanwhile, the debate over in-person learning continues in this province. Students are learning virtually until at least next Monday. And Colin DeMello has more on this report. As students in other provinces head back to their classrooms, Ontario parents are feeling uncertain. Schools in this province are tentatively scheduled to reopen for in-person learning on January 17th. We are hopeful that we will be able to return shortly, but in the end, we take our lead from the Ministry of Education and Public Health officials. The Ford government has given no guarantees about in-person learning resuming next week, nor has it indicated that it's deviating from the current plan. But as the Omicron variant continues to drive up hospitalizations, some health care advocates believe reopening schools next week could make the situation worse. It's not about the kids. It's about the system and what the system can cope. We need to slow it down or people, including kids, will actually not have access to ICUs. But some who work in intensive care insist children can and should return. If we could keep daycares open, if we could keep Amazon factories open, we just need to prioritize our, our schools. The province has been working to improve safety for students and staff, distributing additional portable air filtration systems for classrooms and N95 masks for educators. Approximately 600,000 non-fit tested N95 masks uh, for staff. We already have HEPA filters in all occupied classrooms at the TDSB. 
However, we anticipate receiving nearly 300 additional units. But critics say the government needs to focus on students as well by providing better quality masks for kids to ensure a safe return. If the schools end up not going back and kids are online for a further amount of time, uh, that sits at the feet of, uh, of Doug Ford and his unwillingness all along for two years now to appropriately invest in the safety of our schools. School boards are warning, however, regardless of when students are back in class, parents should prepare for a disruptive winter ahead. MPP Michael Gravel is encouraging all Thunder Bay residents to get their booster shots after Gravel recently received his. With nearly all of the province witnessing a startling increase in COVID cases, Gravel says now more than ever, we need to protect ourselves and our loved ones. He adds that it's clear from all the medical advice that getting the vaccine and the booster are a crucial part to helping slow the down the spread of the virus. From my own experience and from those certainly of people that I'm closest to, they've been very keen to get the, the booster shot as well. And again, I know it's not always easy to book the shots, but right now the... Uh, the district health unit is doing everything it can to make sure that people get access to the shots as quickly as possible, and we want to continue to encourage them to get their shots. Along with the booster shot, Gravel says that rapid tests are also an important tool for protecting the community, and he hopes the free kits can become more easily obtainable. Ontario Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs was consulting with stakeholders from around the northwest today, northwest today, seeking ideas on what the 2022 provincial budget should contain. Leaders from many local organizations had their say in the virtual pre-budget session with all with the all-party committee. The see those bellows has more. Discussions surrounded many issues important to those across our region, and not surprisingly, there was a strong focus on topics related to the pandemic. COVID-19 has revealed many problems within the healthcare sector, including here in the region. The Northern Ontario School of Medicine's Assistant Dean, Dr. Sarah Newbury, provided a presentation on their physician workforce strategy, highlighting the medical needs of Northern Ontario. At last estimate, just under 84% of citizens in northwestern Ontario reported having a primary care provider, and that is well below the Ontario average of 94%. Life expectancy in the north is two and a half to three years less than the Ontario average. Newbury also stressed that Northern Ontario as a whole is short 325 physicians. This was an issue prior to COVID-19 that was just made worse by the pandemic. The same can be said about the long-term care sector, also a focus of the pre-budget consultation. Chair of the Thunder Bay Health Coalition, Jules Tupker, provided a presentation explaining the difficulties that come with trying to staff long-term care homes. Providing new beds doesn't mean anything if you don't have the staff. In my presentation, I talked to you about there's, there were 64 vacant beds uh, beds in a long-term care facility here in Thunder Bay that they couldn't fill because they don't have the staff. Another brief presentation was held by Poverty Free Thunder Bay, a local group advocating for change at the local, provincial and national level. Spokesperson Tracy McKinnon stressed the importance of expanding supports and services for individuals, including what she considers a welfare program that does not provide enough assistance to those in need. Only 733 a month for full benefits on welfare. If you have no fixed address, it will be a lot less. Not enough to live on. Not enough to keep up with rent, utilities and cheap food. Not enough for bus fare and endless appointments. The presentation and question periods that occurred Monday morning will help the provincial government determine how the 2022 budget reflects the needs of Northern Ontario and the province as a whole. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. The City of Thunder Bay is recommending that Council sign off on a termination of its licensed private home child care program. City administrators say staffing troubles have made it difficult to run the program and it would soon run at a significant deficit. The program is complimentary, complimentary to the city's four child care centers, serving four home sites and 24 children. The move would mean $100,000 would be absorbed back into the 2023 municipal child care budget. The majority of the funds would go towards creating an early childhood educator one position. The program had previously run at a surplus of $120,000, but if the city were to continue it beyond the July 1st termination date, it would run at a $120,000 Deficit. Previous years, there's actually been a financial incentive. While, while the DSAB was arguably being overpaying the city for the delivery of the actual service level, th that funding was kind of subsidizing the rest of childcare. But we've been told that that's 
not going to be the case anymore. And if the notice were given, we would, uh, one of the things that we would consider is putting out an expression of interest to see if there are other uh, licensed providers willing to, uh, to administer this program. Council will also vote on approving funds to equip the city's satellite rinks and Fort William Gardens with more protective netting. The total cost would be roughly $284,000. After almost 40 years in municipal politics, Atacokan Mayor Dennis Brown is calling it a career. Brown was first elected in 1980, and aside from a couple of years out of office, he always held the position of Reeve, Councillor, or Mayor since then. Adam Riley recently caught up with Brown to recap his incredible career. It's time for me to move on. For 38 years, the name Dennis Brown has been synonymous with municipal government in Atacokan. But for the 2022 municipal election, his name will not be on the ballot. Brown grew up in Devlin and later moved to Atacokan, where he had a career as an educator before first being elected in 1980 to the role of Reeve, which unfortunately was also the time when the small community began to shrink as the result of a loss of a major employer, the Steep Rock Iron Mine, with its population dipping from 7,000 in its heyday to just under 3,000 today. We lost pr approximately 1,100 jobs. And that's what was very, very uh, crucial to the town of Atticokan. And, and, you know, since then, we have, we've been able to regain some jobs, but uh, nothing like that. Brown credits some of the town's recovery to Atticokan securing itself as the site of Ontario Power Generation's coal plant in 1985, which was later converted to biomass. He says he wanted to see Atticokan succeed and committed many years towards advocating for industry to come to the community. While serving as both Reeve and Mayor, Brown also took on other roles, including three terms as President of the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association. We wanted to work a lot with, uh, I, at least I did, uh, with the, uh, the Northwestern Ontario people because that helped us community as well. Part of what drove Brown for the last four decades was his love for his community and a belief in a strong quality of life in Atacokan, all while trying to keep the town's debt low. He says he accomplished that by supporting many projects such as the construction of a new town hall, improvements at the sewage treatment plant and upgrades to the town's arena and pool, all while lobbying for government funding. Most recently, Brown was happy to see Aspen Court, a new supportive seniors complex, open for residents. He says he is thankful for the trust that residents have placed in him over the years. I enjoy doing it. It gave me something to do after I was retired as a teacher. And I, my wife left us, say, you know, in 2012. That was a sad thing, too. So I, I had to be doing something, to keep, keep busy. And so this certainly was, was important. And uh, I thought if I could help the town of Attico and get better, I'd sure like to do that. The next municipal election will take place on October 24th. Adam Riley, TBT News. Well, temperatures plummeted in Thunder Bay this morning, reaching minus 40 degrees Celsius with the wind chill. And with conditions like that, a local outreach service is once again patrolling the streets to ensure Thunder Bay's most vulnerable are safe from the cold. The Street Outreach Service, or SOS, organized by Shelter House, is a team of skilled individuals out on the road every day offering services to homeless, intoxicated, and high-risk individuals. The Transportation and Patrol Service operates between 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. seven days a week. Shelter House Executive Director Michelle Jordan says the service is extremely important during the winter months. That we transport people to appropriate shelters, to hospital, to detox when necessary. Um, and it's really scary out there when people don't have the means to get a hold of SOS. So the team carries items such as clothing, food, water, and harm reduction supplies. If you see anybody who could use help from the SOS team, you can call 630-7678. With the deep freeze we are currently experiencing, the Canadian Coast Guard Samuel Risley Icebreaker is currently in Thunder Bay to assist in getting the last remaining grain shipments out of the local port and on their way. The Risley and her crew were taking a break today following several days of icebreaking operations in the local harbour. The ice has been getting thicker during this recent cold snap and local port officials say starting tomorrow, the powerful 70 meter long vessel will be very busy over the next few days as the final five Lakers are loaded with grain and sent on their way. The icebreaker is expected to leave the Thunder Bay area by Thursday to ensure all vessels make it through the Sioux locks before they close on January 15th. While with restrictions closing many businesses and activities, the local ski hills have been seeing increased numbers as they've been allowed to stay open this year. 
And with both Loch Lomond and Mount Baldy adding new, new runs due to the recent snowfall, outdoor enthusiasts are braving the cold and hitting the slopes. Mitchell Ringos was at both ski hills yesterday and has more in this report. Over at Loch Lomond's ski area, the north side of the hill is finally open, adding 17 extra runs for skiers and snowboarders to test their skills. The only run left is the Giant and is expected to be open in just a few days when touch-ups are complete. Loch Lomond General Manager Jason Gary says the recent snowfalls of up to 40 centimeters really helped to get more runs open. And with recent restrictions, Gary is grateful the hill wasn't closed, but is hoping everything can get back to the way it was at the end of the month. It was really almost as close as we could get to business as usual here. And uh, it had been a really nice start to the season. Um, so then with the latest changes in the, uh, the rules on how we could do that, yeah, it's definitely affected us in our operations. And over at Mount Baldy Ski Resort, more runs were also available. Currently, the Gold, Hornet, Shotgun and Barry Biggs are fully accessible from the T-Bar. And as for the main, Mount Baldy co-owner Daniel Cardis is shooting for one more week to have the run open. While the lookout will take more time as the wind has affected the spread of snow. With recent restrictions, Cardis says he was shaking in his boots waiting for the news. And with being allowed to stay open, it was a breath of fresh air, as there isn't much else to do at the moment. We're just doing what we're told and keeping uh, everyone socially distanced. And uh, hopefully this will end sooner than later. We're hoping just to the end of the month, but we'll see what happens. And with Hills able to stay open, along with new runs at both Baldy and Lock, we talked to local skiers and snowboarders about how nice it was to still be able to carve down the local slopes. I'm so grateful that we have our hills open. Um, it's great for my physical health and my mental health. Um, just being outside and having the wind on my face is my favorite thing. Yeah, it's a game changer, you know, just to get out, enjoy some fresh air, and, you know, spend time with family skiing, even, even though you've never tried it before. So. Probably, I was super happy when I heard that. I thought it was gonna shut down because I play hockey and baseball, so everything's canceled now, so, and skiing's probably one of my favorite things to do. And even with the wind up to 30 kilometers an hour and it feeling more like minus 35, that didn't stop local skiers and snowboarders from coming out to both hills. But as for me, I think it's time to head back inside. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News.